Greetings once again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When one is properly baptized, biblically baptized, and few are, for few churches do, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, one, according to Scripture, is added to the church of Scripture, which is called his body. We're going to look at a church in Scripture called the church in Philadelphia. But let us look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, in our Bibles. For there we read in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, these words. And I read, quote, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Now, there's many scriptures I want to cover, actually many points that I want to cover in this message called the church in Philadelphia. The main point of this scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, that I want to cover is that we are baptized into the body. But there's a peripheral point I want to make on this scripture to get across, and that is that we're all made to drink of one spirit. When you are baptized for the remission of sins, as Acts 2.38 teaches, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Moving on, in regards to becoming a member, we can go to Ephesians 5, verse 28 and 29. And it tells us there about being a member of his body. I read Ephesians 5, 28, For he who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Notice the connection between church and body. And no this, we become a member of that body, of that church, according, again, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, when we are baptized into it. One other scripture, Ephesians 1, 22, we go to, and this is all introduction to our message. It says in Ephesians 1, 22, and I apologize to the congregation before me, normally I have the scriptures printed out for you, but it's good sometimes for you just to have your Bible there with the index finger a little bit wet so you can flip fast into the scriptures. And I love to hear them pages of flipping. We read Ephesians 1, 22, quote, And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him head over all things to the church which is his body, who fills all in all. Now we might come back, if time allows, to that Ephesians 1 passage, because in it is the theme prayer that I'm using. The word itself, the word church, means the called out, the called out ones. It's ecclesia in the Greek. Now this message is not a study on the church of Scripture. But I want you to know that there is a church in Scripture and how you became a member of it, and that we've already covered. But I want to point out that the churches in Scripture have different characteristics. And it occurred to me while I was preparing this message that sometimes we've got to recognize that churches themselves have different callings. Think about that. Now, those that join us here in this church recognize, I'm sure, if they've been joining us very long, is that we seem to have a different calling, a different direction, a different purpose than some other congregations. There are congregations of called out ones in different areas, and they do different things. We see that in the seven churches of Asia. They certainly had, well, now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we don't all have the same general calling, but I'm, I'm not going to the word means called out. Let's just lay that aside. What I really want us to center in on now is this. The churches in Asia had different characteristics. There are seven churches mentioned in the first part of the book of Revelations, known as the seven churches of Asia. There was Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. 
Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. One time a member of this church, a satellite member in another state that joins us through satellite, and by the way, if you're joining us through internet or through radio or um, the like, it's all through satellite because this message right now that I'm preaching is going up to a satellite first, and that's how it gets out there to everybody else. So we have literally satellite members, so to speak, and they join us. One satellite member wrote to me, I think it was about a year ago, about the seven churches in Asia. Which one are we? I thought that was interesting. Have you ever thought about it? If somebody asked you, which one of these seven churches in Asia does your church fit as far as characteristics go? How would you answer? Well, that's why we have the message before us. The church in Philadelphia. Because the man that wrote me pointed out, and I think correctly so, that he and his brother had studied into it and thought that we fit the church in Philadelphia. Now, I've done a little study in this week about the churches in Asia, the seven churches. It's interesting to me that two of the churches understood the Jew issue. One was, of course, in Revelation 2.9. The other one was in Revelation 3.9. The one was Smyrna, and the other one, Philadelphia. It also occurred to me that there were two churches that understood the door. Now, there have been arguments or discussions about what these churches represent. Some say these churches represent church ages. Others say they just represent the characteristics and have always been these churches. We got to say this. Sometimes we can get boxed in. It could be both. But I do think that these churches are still here today in characteristic. And I think that what that man sent me was right, that the church that you are attending today, if you're attending through the internet, satellite, or shortwave radio, or even here physically, you're attending the church in Philadelphia. And so I thought it would be good for us to look at that church and see what it had, what it needed, and most importantly, what it needed to do. Let us read. It's found in Revelation chapter 3. And we start with verse 7, Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them to come and bow down at your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. That hour which is coming, which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any more. and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what is he saying through the Holy Spirit to this church in Philadelphia that I think you are attending. There are points. We can't cover all because of the time I see on the clock, all the points in the depth that I think would be good to cover. Maybe we'll have another message, but I want you to notice some points here. The church was called Philadelphia. It talked about the key. It talked about a phrase called the key of David, a door. Talks about standing near a door. 
Talks about open and closed. Talks about power, a little power, but power. Talks about not denying the name. It talks about the synagogue of Satan where the Jews are. Talks about the word of my perseverance. It talks about testing, how there is an hour, of, uh, how there's a testing coming on the whole world and how they will be kept from the testing. And it talks about this. And this is an important point in regards to where this church is and also the church of Laodicea is. It's very close to the, it has both of those two churches have something about the door. You don't want to be in the church in Laodicea. Isn't that the one that, uh, well, isn't that the one that says he, um, I forget, I didn't write about Laodicea here, but uh, they're neither hot nor cold, and the Lord said, you make me sick. You ever gotten sick enough where you just finally stick the finger down your throat to puke to feel better? That's the church you don't want to be in, amen? You want to be hot or cold. But anyway, both of those are right there near the door, and I want you to notice one of these points. I am coming, and I'm coming quickly, and it might be faster than we realize, and he says, overcome, 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 and he says, don't let anyone take your crown. Now, those are just 11 points I wrote down. There's probably more there, and we can't cover them all properly, but let's cover the first point. The first point is the name, Philadelphia. Interesting name. Because I looked it up in the 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and this is what it said right off, first sentence. The chief city of Pennsylvania and a port of entry. A port of entry. Now I say that to you from the La Porte Church of Christ. And I've told you before that La Porte means the door. And this Philadelphia church had an open door. The others didn't, you see. Or they didn't take it, one or the other. I think it's significant. And the word itself, I'm told, means brotherly love. Well, that don't fit you, Pastor Peters. That sure don't fit you. I've been on the Internet, and they call you a hate group. I talked with a man today, and, oh, not this week, I should say, and, uh, he had talked with the preacher and his brother because they were all upset that he came to this church last week. I said to the young man, I said, now do you think your brother would have dragged you over to the preacher if you had come down to, say, a bar, a striptease joint, or Hooters, or something like that, instead of church at the Laporte Church of Christ? He said, no. <laughs> you know, what has come of this world, you see, but they've looked on the internet and they see uh, that this is a hate group. And so one of the things that was said to him is, this, well, why is all this bad stuff said about Pastor Peters? Now, I've never been on the Internet to look up what is said about me because I think it would upset me. So I've never done it. But I am told we're called a hate group. Well, why, Pastor Peters? And you're calling yourself the Church of Brotherly Love? I want you to notice that that Philadelphia word means, does it not, brotherly love? Why is it they call us a hate group? Because we love the brethren. You see, if you love everybody, then you're not a hate group. But if you love the brethren, as in the 12 brothers who had a father named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, known as the 12 tribes. And if you love them, if you love your brethren, if you love your kinsmen, you are a hater in this world today. Now, I think that's significant, as well as this, concerning the word Philadelphia, and that is that we have a national message. It's not just a message of personal salvation, we preach more on personal salvation than any other church because most churches out there preach the sinner's prayer, preach except Jesus, and they eliminate baptism in the name of Jesus for the remission of sin. So I tell you, they don't preach personal salvation as they should. I do think that there is something to this. Those that believe in Jesus, there is a salvation, but it's much different than what we realize. You see what I'm saying? 
And I'm not going to go there because I don't understand everything that's there. But I do understand Acts 2.38. And I do understand that my sins were washed away when I was baptized for the remission of sins. You understand that? But we preach on a national message. Now, isn't it interesting where our nation was born? Where was the Declaration of Independence signed in 1776? In Philadelphia. Significant. Let's move on, though, because there's so many other points to cover. And the one that I wanted to really cover a little bit stronger is this, the key of David. The church in Philadelphia had the key of David. Now, David's part in the kingdom. Think about this. David wanted to build the temple. And the Lord said, no, no, I'm not going to have you do it, David. I'm going to let your son do that. Well, David fought so his son could. And David gathered the material and secured the land, the borders of his nation, so that the boy, the Solomon, could build the temple. They both had a different calling. You see what I'm saying? And remember this. According to Ephesians, he gave some as, as apostles, some as pastors, some as prophets, and so forth and so on, for the equipping. Preachers have different callings themselves. But back to this point, David was called to be a warrior. You see, he was a shepherd, but he was a warrior shepherd, was he not? He loved shepherding sheep. You can tell that. He longed for the old days that we had up there in Pony Park and over Porphy Peaks and all those things. You know, beautiful days and memories, but he had to move on. But you can tell in his writings, he remembered the days of being out there with the sheep. And he was a shepherd, but he was a warring shepherd. He shepherded the flock, but he was one that recognized that if he truly loved his brother and the flock, the sheep, that he had to hate the bears and the lions that would come and the wolves that would arise to devour those sheep. Are you with me? And so it was David who put out the imprecatory prayers more than anybody else of the scriptures that I can see. And there is only probably one church that I know of today. There might be others because I don't know them all out there. Lord takes care of his business. I got my hands full here. But there's one church right here in Laporte, which I think fits the Philadelphia church, that puts out weekly the pound and pulverize with imprecatory prayer power. You see? Those are warrior prayer psalms. And David was a warrior. There was one battle after another, but there was one victory after another. There is no victory in Jesus without a skirmish, without a battle, without a war to be fought. What sermons have come from this pulpit? I've got a long series called The Unseen War. I've got several series on spiritual warfare. And one could say to David, what is your secret, David? Or another way of saying that is, what is the key of your success, David? And the church in, Le in Philadelphia had the key of David. Now, don't think the enemy doesn't sometimes wonder what is the key of your success. If you read the story of Samson, you know perfectly well that they laid in waiting. They hired an old gal. She was a witch, but I bet she was a pretty one. And they were out to find out the secret and to take it from Samson. Amen? because he had a secret of success. And so I say to you, don't think that I'm just blowing steam or smoke when I say they took away the door. They're making people today think that Easter is some kind of special day when they miss the Passover day. You see what I'm saying? Because the key to David's secret was the door. Look at the context again as we go back to Revelation chapter 3. And we read in verse 7, of Revelation 3. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David. Now I'm going to stop there a second. And get ready to pop that back up there on the screen. But he has the key of David. What do you think of when you see a key? When you find a key in your house, do you not ask yourself, What door does this go to? You see, key and door go together, like horse and carriage. Let's go back to the scripture. 
He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens, says. What is the opening and shutting? It's the door. I know your deeds, but I have put before you an open door which no one can shut. Now I'm going to stop there and go back to preaching a little bit. That open door is the door day. I've preached on it plenty, and it's open and nobody can shut it. You know, We've got a book called Solar Sanity Versus Lunar Lunacy. And that book, when people read it, they cannot anymore, if they're honest, keep those filthy, vile days that Jesus hates. He said, I hate your new moon festivals. That book right there on the screen, Solar Sanity Versus Lunar Lunacy, is at our website, scripturesforamerica.org, and can be ordered from us, and it'll teach you the importance of the door day. Now, the door day was April 2nd, and I'm going to say again on this 16th day, I think it is of April right now, that you can, on May 2nd, from noon to May, sec uh, to May 3rd on noon, keep you have a second chance to keep that door day you'd better if you want to be kept from the hour of testing that's coming on this world and i'll keep moving on but those are important points and you can read about it in that book and that book's at the website or you can call or write us for it but moving on the key the door is open and no one can shut it once you see it this time you're not going to have it shut and david saw the importance as a warrior of the thumb and the four fingers, and we've talked about the thumb day being the door day, the Passover day, and then the four fingers. David kept those days. It was a key of David, and this church in Philadelphia understood the key of David. Now, isn't that exciting? And we move on, the door, which no one can shut. I put an open door before you. Well, I've covered that, and I've covered this. I haven't covered this, though, in Isaiah 22, verse 22, because here we have a passage that's very similar to what we just read in Revelation 3. It says in Isaiah 22, 22, quote, Then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut, and when he shuts, no one will open. And the man that sent to me the email about us being the Philadelphia church, in his opinion, said this, that that word key in Isaiah 22, 22 is 4, 6, 6, 8 in Strong's, and it means to open, to set free, to loose. The same key in Revelation 3, 9 is 2, 8, 0, 7, and it means to close, to lock, or to shut. Let us move on. What comes right after the door in this scripture? A little power. Let me tell you something about a little power. It's a whole lot better than no power. And this church had witnessed a little power. And I'm going to say it's little because it's little compared to what is coming. Amen? Amen? And I tell you what, it gets addicting. A little power will, you know, uh, you become, you want more power. But the churches of the day deny the power. Let us go to a day that Paul describes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3 rather. 2 Timothy 3, 1 is where we're going. And he talks about in the last days how people would be, and so they are in the churches today. It says in 2 Peter, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, quote, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, and they're coming. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unloving, unholy. Think of that word unholy. I'll mention it here in a minute, but let's move on. Irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutals, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power and avoid such men as these. In the last days they deny the power. And by the way, that word unloving, just for a free side note, is number 1411. And if you look that up in Strong's, it means, no, not 1411. That particular word, I, I didn't write the number down, but it means hard-hearted towards kinsmen or brethren. 
You see, that's the age we live in. But the church in Philadelphia had brotherly love when the rest of the world is hard-hearted towards their kinsmen, their brethren. Just a side note, but the main point here is the word power. They deny the power. And that word means this. It's 1411 in Strong's miraculous power. By implication, a miracle itself. Churches today deny the miracles. We have a little power, but I say to you out there that are with us here in in spirit and on satellite that is part of this church that I think fits Philadelphia, we even have problems with this thing of power and miracles, do we not? But we have a little. But may God find us not denying that those powers are there and they are for us. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, because it gives you an idea of what this word power is about. It's translated here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 as miracles. I read, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, second prophets, thirdly teachers, and that, after that miracles. I'm going to stay right there on the screen, keep it there. But that word miracle that you see on the screen or you see in your Bible here, that is the same word translated power over there when it says they deny the power. They deny miracles. It's the same word. Miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And then he says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Same word workers of miracles have all the gifts of healing do all speak with tongues do all interpret I want to make a fast comment here notice here that the gift of healing is different than the gift of miracles a lot of times we have healings we had healings on the day of Pentecost here and I got reports for those of you out there that partook of, com of communion on Pentecost of healing and we think that's a miracle that's nothing in fact, I don't know if we have time in this message, but I'm going to show you where the scripture says Jesus could do no miracle there, but he healed. To us, it's miraculous, I understand, but scripturally, there is a difference. But I want you to understand this from scripture. Also, this is a side note. Do all speak in tongues? Oh, yes, Pastor Peters, all has to speak in tongues or you don't have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> is that what your Bible says? And I say this, those guys that come into my midst and says all of a sudden, you all have speaking tongues and I'm going to teach you how to speak in tongues, blah, 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 blah. I say, out of here. Because you don't line up with the scripture and I'm one of those guys that says, the Bible says, boys. You see? Boys and girls, this is the time of deception. But don't any of you be turned off on what is truly Pentecostal as well. You see what I'm saying? Well, that's just a side note. No, not all speak in tongues and so forth and so on. But I want you to notice that the word miracle is the same word, power. I want you to go to a scripture in Romans 9, verse 17. And I've got to move off of this subject of power. I want to spend more time on it. But it says here, and by the way, I, I think I'll come back to that comment that I made where Jesus could do no miracles. You think I'm making it up, you can read it on your own sometime, Mark 6, verse 5. But I'm going to sometime, Lord willing, take time to point out why. That's an important point. Because when we understand the why, we'll have more miracles, more power here. Amen? But what has God got planned? They've got something planned. And by the way, right now, before the time runs out, I want us to pray right now. I'm just going to make this prayer up. Pray with me. And then you, it'll be a simple prayer. I thought about it before. You start praying it now because May 1st is soon going to be here. Our Father in heaven, I call upon you and Jesus, you who saves us from our enemies. Cut our enemies off at the pass. And do not let them have come to pass what they've got planned on May 1st. Bring them into the pit they dig. Let the trap they lay ensnare them. In Jesus' name, amen.
they have a plan and they have already put us in a Red Sea predicament. I don't think I have time in this sermon to tell you, but they've got plans on May Day. May 2nd is the second chance to take of the door day. But on May Day, which is the day that Adam Weshaupt in 1776 formed the Illuminati, this is their special day, you see. And they're not going to get done what they plan on doing. Because they don't know that although they think they've been making the plans, God's been planning all along to show his power, his miracles, through these vessels of destruction. Let us read. Romans 9, verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Amen. And so we are a church that does not deny the power. Now we even all, come on, we have a little problem sometimes. We tend to. We saw a little bit of power on Super Bowl Sunday. And then after they were powerless, it reminds me of the old Roadrunner uh, in the uh, old coyote in the Roadrunner cartoons, you know, where he pushes down to explode the dynamite. Nothing happens. He pushes, pushes several times. Nothing happened on Super Bowl Sunday, and then we have a tendency to deny that we had anything to do with it. You see what I'm saying? We deny power sometimes. We all have to work on it. This church in Philadelphia had a little power. Why don't we have more out there anointing? Because we have an awful lot that really deny that that anointing oil has any kind of power whatsoever. In Sunday school class today, it was pointed out, I believe by this man back here, that was it in Iowa City? that there was a courthouse whose roof was tore off with a tornado this week. So I had our web man check it out, and he gave me this note just before I came to the pulpit. He said, he said, if that storm was in Iowa City, that is in Johnson County, that courthouse was anointed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, we know there's a little power around here, and we're going to get a little more, a little more, a little more. Because Jesus said, greater things than these you shall do, and this church believes it, do you? But most do not believe those miracles are for today anymore. This church in Philadelphia did. Why are there not more pound than pulverized with imprecatory prayer power? We handed these out to everybody here. They're there on the internet for you out there. And those that want to get on, on snail mail and receive them, you can get them. But do you pray them every day? If you don't, you are denying the power thereof. Let me tell you something else. And I want to move on to these other points about denying power. And that is there is another power. The Lord has created all power. He's above everything. Uh, in fact, let's go, before I make this point, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. We see that same word, power, miracles. And we're going to read Ephesians 1, starting with verse 15, a passage here. I read, quote, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus, which existed among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Pray that for the Branson gathering, but let's go on. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray, now I want you to really pray this, I have been. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. That's the word miracle, power. 
I'll read on. There are in, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church. That's why they don't want you baptized, because that's how you get into the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I say to all of you here, are you still with me? Is it making sense? Because we've got about 15 minutes to cover all these other points. I do want to point out, though, that the eyes of our heart are to be open to see the surpassing greatness of his miracles, his power. Then it says there that, He's far above all rule, authority, and power. Now, those are two different words. That second power is a word which means exousia, and it has to do with mastery, superhuman potentate in control. It's the same word found in Ephesians 6 when it says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual forces in high places. And I say to you that there are those out there that deny those powers too. They deny that there is a Satan who is as a roaring lion. And Yo, not me. I don't deny this in the mind. Oh, yes, you do. Oh, not me. I, I, Satan has no power here. When you say Satan has no power in your home, you deny the power of Satan. The Bible teaches that as I have taught the Sunday school class today, to ever be on the alert for he is as a what? A roaring lion. And that's why I pray on the armor every day. We pray armor on our family, and we pray a hedge of thorns, and we pray the Lord's Prayer because we do not deny the power that's there. And we recognize we have the greater power, but moving on. We are living in a Red Sea predicament. I don't have time to go into it. I don't think I'll take the time because there's some other things I want to point out. But that Red Sea predicament is coming upon us very shortly. Notice that this church in Philadelphia did not deny the what? The name. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that we come out with the name book, no other name, and that we're offering it, and we're making a point of it? You know, we have denied it some. I denied in the past that it had any kind of power that it made any difference. Oh, those, you know, whenever you hear the name Yashpuka, is that the name? Yashpuka? Yeah. That makes me puke every time I hear Yahshua. It's not even in the Bible. We've come out against them. Suddenly it's like, whoa, there's power in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's why we put this book up there on the screen. You need to order it and read it. There's power in the name of Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. And you hear it right here in the church in Philadelphia that does not deny it. And boy, the enemy has slipped in and got us some in our midst. They're no longer with us doing that. And I want you to notice that that church in Philadelphia understood something, that there's a synagogue of Satan. And who's in it? The Jews, the very people that all the Judeo-Christian churches in the land point to and call God's chosen people. But this church in Laodicea, just like the other church there in, in uh, Smyrna, understood the Jew issue. Now the difference is the church in Smyrna had to endure suffering and persecution because there was no mention of the door. But I want you to notice the church in Philadelphia... The Jews came and bowed down at their feet. And I say, you bow down to my snake stomping boots and kiss them. Kiss the soul of them. You stinking, slithering snakes. And they know we have power. Because we've gone through the door. You see what I'm saying? And as a result of that power, 
there is a scripture that I do not claim. I want you to go to Matthew 24. It is part of prophecy, and I believe it's, it's the hour of testing, but I don't claim it. And I'll tell you why. Let us read it. Matthew 24, 7. It says, Matthew 24, 7. For a nation will rise, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and, will be, and you will be hated by all nations on account of my name. And at that time many will fall away, and many will deliver up one another, and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise, and many will be misled. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. Now, I do not claim that scripture for the Church of Philadelphia. Why not, Pastor Peters? Because the church in Philadelphia escapes these things. I mean, can you see David? Okay, men, now let's get together. We're going to go out there and fight the enemy, but I want you to know most of us are going to be decimated. They're going to throw us in prison. We're going to lose. We're going to spread our blood, but we're going to do it for the Lord, and I'm glad to be a martyr. Come on, boys, let's go and let them kill us. Was that David's mentality? No, and it wasn't the mentality of our forefathers in 1776 as they faced the greatest nation on the face of this earth and they signed their Declaration of Independence and they pledged their honor, their fortune, and their lives if they had to. And one of them said, give me liberty or give me death, but the church in Philadelphia says, give me liberty or die, sucker! Because that's the key of David. And David had one success after another, and he was a little shepherd boy. And when that great growling giant came to that little guy and stood there in his way, he said, I'm going to kill you. And he said, David said, nay, <laughs> I'm going to kill you. And he did. And he did time after time after time. And what was his secret against odds that you could not, that were infathomable? He had the key, David. He had gone through the door. You see what I'm saying? And one of the keys is you go out to battle in victory. There's victory in Jesus. Yes, there are those who are going to be martyred according to this scripture, but it's not going to be those in the church in Philadelphia. Who says? You, Pastor Peters? No. Jesus, the head of that church. Notice what he said. Let's go back to that passage in Revelation chapter 3. And we read there in Revelation chapter 3, Oh, let's start with verse 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Notice they're kept from it. It passes over them. This church in Philadelphia, is it significant? I think it is. And I think as we're running out of time, I need to make these points. A time is testing is coming. I pointed out in Sunday school class today when Jesus was baptized, the first thing that happened, he was led into the wilderness to be tested. We are tested. But we need to understand we are called to be what? Overcomers. What do you have to have more than anything else to be an overcomer? Something to overcome more than anything else. And Jesus said, I am coming, coming quickly. There was a door there for the church in Philadelphia, and there was a door there for the church in Laodicea. The ones in Laodicea could have took it. If you're in that church, I say get out. Get in one that's hot or cold and go through the door that's still open to you. And I'll talk about that in the radio broadcast this week. And I pointed out that those kind of things took place in the church in, on Azusa Street in 1906. Well, there is a lot of lies about that. And we're going to find the truth of that on, what is the date today, the 16th, 
On the 19th, the radio broadcast of the 19th, which will be archived at our radio broadcast site there on www.scripturesforamerica.org. I'm having an interview with two men. It's interesting. Would it be the 18th? Oh, no, it'll be Wednesday night. Wednesday night. But anyway, it's interesting that Isuzu, how's it spelled? A-Z-U-S-A. So it did land right on that day. And the person that called me, I said, did this happen on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon? He said, Sunday afternoon. I knew the rain would fall. It falls in different places at different times. But we are living in prophetic times. And this church in, Le in Philadelphia was living at a time where he said, I come quickly. And that church, not a bad church to be in compared to the other churches described there. And so I entitled the message, The Church in Philadelphia. But a better title would be this as I conclude this message. Oh, before I do that title, let me say this. He said this to those people in the church in Philadelphia. Don't let someone take your crown. Isn't that what he said? What does that mean? You hold your head high. They can call you hate group. They can accuse you of whatever you want. They can come and try to talk you out of the simplest thing of baptism, remission of sins. You don't let anyone. And sometimes they can be ones very close to you. Take your crown. Amen? Amen? You hold on to it, you Church of Philadelphia. I would say a better title, and as I conclude, the Church in Philadelphia. The persevering, overcoming, kinsman brother loving, power seeking and believing, door entering, Jew snake stomping, Jesus name claiming, David like warring, tribulation escaping, church in Philadelphia. That's where I want to be every Sunday. Our Father in heaven, I'm grateful that this Sunday many are here with us and you still have your church in Philadelphia. I feel privileged to be able to preach here and to know that persevering saints are out there Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious to them. Lift your countenance upon them and grant them peace in Jesus' name. Amen. We're adjourned. The preceding message by circuit riding preacher Peter Peters from the Laporte Church of Christ, located at the base of the beautiful Colorado Rocky Mountains in Laporte, Colorado, has been aired on the Scripture for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network and is available on CD or DVD and is archived at the website scripturesforamerica.org. Remember, circuit rider, preacher, and teacher Peter Peters broadcasts live nightly from his Wyoming Radio Ranch, nestled in the Laramie, Wyoming River Valley. It's a working horse and cattle ranch where circuit riding preacher Dr. Peters reaches the lost sheep of the House of Israel worldwide on satellite, internet, and shortwave radio. Dial settings 5755 and 9480. Check out the 24-hour, seven days a week web broadcasting website, sfawbn.com. Scriptures for America Worldwide Broadcasting Network is made possible by the prayers and tithes of the faithful. If you want to write to circuit writing preacher Peter Peters, the address is Scriptures for America, P.O. Box 766, LaPorte, Colorado, 80535 or you can visit us on the web at www.scripturesforamerica.org The preacher will be riding back this way next week and hopes you will too.